Uh, good morning and welcome to the 21st meeting of the committee in 2014. Uh, everyone present is asked to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as they affect the broadcasting system. Uh, some committee members may consult tablets during the meeting. Uh, this is because we provide meeting papers in digital format. Uh, if we move to agenda item one, which is subordinate legislation, uh, today we will consider three negative in instruments. They are the Local Government Pension Scheme Scotland Regulations 2014, SSI 2014-164, the Town and Country Planning General Permitted Development Scotland Amendment, Amendment Order 2014, SSI 2014-184, uh, and the Local Authority Account Scotland Regulations 2014, SSI 2014-204. Two zero zero. Uh, member have, members have a paper from the clerks setting out the purpose of the instruments. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee considered these instruments and drew several issues to our attention, which are set out in the cover paper from the clerk. Do members have any comments to make on any of these instruments? Um, are we agreed not to make any recommendation to the Parliament on any of these instruments? Thank you very much. And agenda item two uh, is an oral evidence session uh, with the Accounts Commission for Scotland on its most recent local government overview report. Uh, I'd like to welcome Douglas Sinclair, uh, Chair of the Accounts Commission for Scotland, uh, Fraser McKinley, Director of Performance and Audit and Best Value at Audit Scotland, uh, and Gordon Smale, Portfolio Manager at Audit Scotland. Uh, you're very welcome, gentlemen. Uh, would you like to make any opening remarks? Thank you very much, uh, Convener. Um, first of all, the Commission welcomes the opportunity to discuss with the Committee the challenges facing local government. As we all know, Scotland's councils provide important services, but they do so against a background of reducing budgets of an ageing population and rising demands and expectations from the people whom they serve. Our work shows that although councils are coping well, they face increasingly difficult choices about how to maximise the value that they get from their available money. To help make those decisions, they need to make better and more consistent use of options appraisal, to look carefully at how services are delivered and to think openly about how services might be delivered in future. They need to ask the question, what works best and can we prove it? Many of the messages in this year's report are not new. Indeed, the fact that they are similar simply serves to underline their continuing importance. I want to emphasise two areas in particular, if I may. The first is the fundamental importance of good governance. It is the foundation of a successful council, with officers and councillors working well together and in a way that engenders the public's trust and confidence. Bad governance, on the other hand, is dysfunctional, time-consuming and expensive. Secondly, the statutory duty of best value remains paramount. We believe strongly that councils that place best value, in other words, continuous improvement in all their functions, at the centre of all that they do, are best placed to deal with change. Although we recognise the current context is challenging, the Commission is looking for councils to raise their ambition and up the pace of improvement. For our part, we are considering carefully how the Commission can provide further support through its audit work in relation to local government. Convener, my colleagues and I are very happy to answer questions. Thank, thank you. Sinclair. Um, anyone else wish to add anything? Okay, thank you. Um, you mentioned the uh, demographic time bomb, the ageing population. Uh, and we have just, of course, dealt with an SSI with local government uh, pension schemes. What overview does Audit Scotland and the Accounts Commission have um, in terms of scrutinising local government pension schemes? Gordon. Yes, um, the, very recently, in fact, in the last couple of years, um, the pension, uh, pension scheme accounts are actually subject to separate audit. Prior to that, they form part of the accounts of the, uh, the council administering authority itself. So, it's, for example, um, yeah, the City of Edinburgh's accounts would have included the Lothian pension funds. 
Nowadays, these funds are audited separately, so they're subject to a separate audit annually. There's a separate opinion given by the auditor, and there's a separate report alongside that, in the same way that we do for councils, referring to the main issues about risks and priorities that have come up during the course of the audit. So that extends into looking at areas, for example, how the pension funds uh, are, uh, the governance of them, the committees that oversee them, and the like. So this is a relatively new um, uh, event, if you like, an audit. Um, I think it's um, well well worth us doing that because the, the, the sums that involved are substantial. It's a very complicated area as well. So I think that's a it's a, it's a, a you know, well worth addition to the to the audit process. So uh, as well as as them reporting separately to to yourselves, um, do you carry out any forensic audit on individual um, pension funds at any any point in time? Do you pluck one or two out? on a, a regular basis to have a closer look at? Um, the, 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 the 11 pension funds are subject to the same audit. I think if it is the same way as any of our audit work, if there was any need to probe further into anything, we would, of course, do that. Um, the, the main issue for us is looking at the risks beyond the accounts, how the accounts are presented, presented fairly, uh, the financial performance of the pension funds. If there are issues around uh, the way in which the, the pension fund has been managed or how it's uh, the governance of the pension fund, of course we would look further into that if there were indications we needed to do that. Thank you very much. Uh, continuing on the theme of uh, the ageing population, um, have you found uh, any examples of really good practice uh, in terms of preparations made by local authorities to deal with the demographic difficulties that uh, we have ahead of us? Um, I think we've, we've published some reports convener recently around uh, things like the Reshaping Care for Older People um, report that we did last year, which had some case studies in there, um, uh, which, uh, again, happy to, to send them on to you separately. And I think... Um, our sense is that councils and their partners absolutely recognise the importance of prevention in the widest sense, um, both prevention in terms of giving people and, and children the best start in life, but also in the older population, um, trying to keep people safe and well before they either fall or you know, hurt themselves and end up in hospital, which is um, both traumatic for them and expensive in terms of public services. So uh, I think the public services and councils in particular get that concept. I think what's difficult is actually making the shift from dealing with the impact of that, if you like, when at the point of crisis or in that kind of acute sense, to shifting the resource and the effort to actually preventing these things happen in, in, uh, in future. And I think that's why we've touched on those kinds of things in our community planning audits and some of the performance audits that the Accounts Commission and the Auditor General have done around reshaping uh, care and um, self-directed support was another one where there were some very interesting uh, case studies about how well prepared councils were for the introduction of self-directed support um, uh, that came into being in terms of legislation earlier this year. Um, so there are definitely moves afoot and there are some pockets of good practice uh, which we can dig out for you but I think um, there is a question about scale and pace and the extent to which that's happening as you would hope right across the piece to deal with the size of the challenge that's coming. Okay. I think just, just, just to add to that, I, mean, I, think, I think one of the other issues um, is the fact that good practice is a bad traveller. It's a wonderful phrase from a, a Welsh report on, on public service. And I think there's still a bit in Scotland, if it's not invented here, we're not doing it. I think a challenge for the Commission and other inspectorates is can we quantify, can we quantify good practice and put it together in a single document and try and encourage more councils you, you with me to pick it up and, 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 and health boards and, 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 and copy what is good practice. I think that's a, it's a telling thing from many studies we do. We find good practice in one council and one health board, but it's not been replicated. Um, it's no, there's no good reason why not, why it's not been picked up by other councils, by other health boards. And I think there's more that we should be doing as a commission to encourage others to take up, take up the baton of what is clearly good practice. Um, I think one of the things uh, certainly I welcome is... Uh, catching sight of uh, your reports on a regular basis uh, and obviously from those uh, we garner up information which we often use in scrutinising at this committee um, and it seems to me that um, you know a lot of the things which appear um, in some of your reports which uh, highlight good practice uh, are not uh, looked at to a huge degree by others and, and brought into into play in their own organisations, and I think that's a, a great pity. How do you think um, that we can improve 
um, in terms of disseminating the message uh, from... I, I think, you know, one of the things is when your reports come out, everybody tends to look at the bad and never the good. Mm -hmm. How can we make sure that folk look at the good and, and see if we can ensure that the, that is brought into play in, in other areas? Well, as, as I said, I think one of the things that we, we could look at is the idea of producing an annual digest of good practice. We will soon have finished um, our second round of CPP audits, and what we found in each of the CPPs, examples of good practice, uh, often despite the community planning partnership at the top, there's often good practice happening um, because, because people make a difference uh, and want to work together at local level. I think it's very important we try and capture that in a single document and make that available to the 32 community, community planning partnerships. I think there's also more work, we can, as I say, we can do with the other inspectors who are also identifying finding good practice. And I think the added, I think it would have more of an impact if this was a single digest from the, from the commission from all the other inspectors. I think people would sit up and take note of that. Thank you. Anne McTaggart, please. And following on from that, thanks, convener. Um, that sounds like an excellent idea. Um, can I follow on from some of the questions? Or can I ask some of the questions about community planning partnership? In paragraph 112, um, there mentions community planning um, is at a crossroads. Um, barriers stand in the way. Could I ask you to expand on some of that? Mm -hmm. Well, as you know, the, the statutory duty of, of community planning is just introduced in 2003. And, and it's fair to say it kind of flatlined quite a bit. There was there was a bit of work done. I think people were keen on it, but they were very much focused on, on the day job, uh, delivering services and s working on the CPP was to some extent the Saturday, Saturday job, if I can call it that. There's no doubt an added impetus was given by the introduction of the Statement of Ambition in 2013, the joint statement between the Scottish Government and COSLA. And that, that has created um, a sharp, a sharp uh, uh, much sharper movement in the development of CPPs. But I think our audits do show that there are there are barriers. Um, you have organisations that have different accountabilities. You have, in the, at the end of the day, the community planning partnership is a voluntary partnership. It's not a statutory partnership. Unlike a health and social care partnership, it is a voluntary partnership. Um, so that, that in itself um, creates its own difficulties and own tensions. It makes it, in a sense, harder for people to come together because there isn't an imperative, there isn't a statutory imperative to make them make them make them do it. Um, I think uh, it, what we've found that the key ingredient to a successful community planning partnership is building up trust at the top of the organisation between, say, the leader of the council and the chair of the health board. That dynamic, or the chief executive of the council, chief executive of the health board, because these are the two key players in making community planning work. If they, if they can work together and build up that relationship of trust, then I think they can move forward. I think one of the other barriers has perhaps been that they have perhaps been too ambitious in what they can achieve. Community planning sometimes been seen as a dustbin into which you throw everything. I think it has to be um, a body that, that can add value where it can add most value, and I think that's about reducing inequality, and our audits do show that, that where community planning partnership has a limited number of objectives. Glasgow is a very good example where they have, I think, if I remember correctly, four, three or four objectives, and they've focused on that in a very direct way, whereas other CPPs have tended to uh, draw a much wider canvas, and I think that's meant that the, the, the sense of uh, priorities has become diminished and, and diffused, so that's, that's important as well. I think the other barrier, one of the other barriers, is for them to develop um, performance management arrangements, and we haven't found that in any of our CPPs and effective performance management arrangements. It's quite difficult for one body to hold another body to account to challenge that body to say, well, we don't actually think your contribution to CPP is as good as it might be. Again, that comes back to building that relationship of trust and comfort with each other so they can challenge each other openly. So there's been some good signs of progress. There's good signs of partnership working on the ground, as I mentioned earlier, but there's still a long way to go. Thank uh, you. Thanks, Computer. OK, uh, Alec, please. Just picking up on the planning partnerships, Mm. Um, I mean, they've been around for some time, and I do wonder, because we certainly have the chair on the council and the health board were the two big partners mm -hmm. at the table, it was never clear to me what the role the other partners actually was, and if we're serious about trying to engage more with the private sector yeah. within civic life, within, say, local economic policies, 
you know, uh, it was never clear to me that, that, that who, who was bringing what to the table. And I suppose one of the questions is, is there any evidence um, that savings, given, given the report highlights the, the major financial problems that is facing the public sector, is there savings to be had? If we take, for example, the health and social care partnership, mm -hmm. is that the best model, trying to bring it together in some kind of voluntary partnership, or would you not be actually better looking to how these services perhaps are, 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 are run and, and managed and, and actually bringing them together and combining them? Would that not make more sense than trying to continue year after year to get a voluntary partnership? Well, well, I'm happy to I mean, the, the, I think the important difference between the Community Planning Partnership and the Health and Social Care Partnership is that, as I say, the Community Planning Partnership is a voluntary partnership, whereas Health and Social Care Partnerships are statutory partnerships. They're, they're, they, they have very clear um, outcomes to deliver in, in relation to the government and, and will be accountable for that. There's a very clear line of sight between the government and the Health and Social Care Partnerships. And we've seen the development of two model, the Highland model, where you have the lead agency, where the N NHS Highland is taking responsibility uh, for uh, the provision of all services to older people and are accountable to the council, the chief executive of the um, of the uh, of the health and social care partnerships, accountable to the the council for the delivery of that, and the council has the responsibility for the delivery of all children's services. That that model thus far, I think I'm right in saying, Fraser, correct me if I'm wrong, is is the only one of its kind in Scotland. Yes, yeah. the other the other uh, partners have the other. Uh, other other ones are on the basis of an incorporated, an incorporated body, a joint a joint body, which is actually a local authority body, in in law, and one of which we have a responsibility to audit. So, um, in a sense, there's a how can I put it? There's a there's a um, a higher higher threshold, a higher bar for these bodies because they are statutory bodies. We have a duty to audit them. But there's a limit to how much the the the, audit, the accounts commission can audit a voluntary partnership, by definition, because it's a voluntary partnership. You know. It, 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 there's a limit to that. Whereas, in terms of a statutory partnership, then, in a sense, we'll be auditing them, auditing them in the, exactly the same way as we'd audit the council. That's that's the difference. To pick up on to pick up on the savings point of the health yep. and social care partnership. I mean, should should we assume that these bodies, because it seems to be that it's still two organisations. So, in the case of five, NHS yep. five, will determine a budget that will go into the Health and Social Care Partnership, as, as will Fife Council. There will still be major budget pressures there. Um, the acute services in health will still be making major demands on mm. the health services. And there doesn't seem to me that there's a clear, a clear sort of split of what sits within the Health and Social Care Partnership, particularly for health point of view, it seems to be a bit cloudy. Should there be savings, should there be efficiencies that can be gained? And would we not be better just simply saying that we have a health and social care service and, 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 and it's run by whoever, the local authority or, or the, the health authority? Well, we'll come back to Mr Sinclair. Um, so I, I think in a sense, the legislation around health and social care is, is designed to try and do that, Mr Reilly. And I think Obviously, it's very early days. They're not up and running yet. They come into formal being in 1st of April next year, so they're running in shadow at the moment. But I think what you're highlighting is a real question about, and, and I think we're picking up a degree of concern out there, that a lot of the attention and focus has been about the governance and integration of the arrangements, and potentially at the risk of losing sight of the fact that the whole point in this exercise is about service integration. It's about making the service more joined up more efficient, more effective for service users on the ground. That's that's the whole point. And I think inevitably, and don't get me wrong, we're all for good governance and strong governance, but I think there's been so much activity and concern around that that, um, that I think people will need to readjust and, and remind themselves that it is actually the bit on the ground that's going to make the difference. And the danger is that even though you've got a single accountable officer um, for the integrated joint board to give it its, its formal title, um, how does that person ensure that the different bits of the system, health and council, are actually combining? And certainly um, the, the, the view from the Highland experience, both on the health side and on the council side, is that the lead agency model, while very challenging and not straightforward at all to, to manage, is a very effective way of genuinely integrating services, because you don't need to worry about that parallel stuff. You, they've basically transferred one 
you know, in both directions, older people and, and, and children's services in their case. So, so it's interesting that, as, as the chair says, that Highland at the moment are the only ones that are going down lead agency model, and we think that the other um, 31 are going down a integrated joint board model. And obviously, uh, as the chair says, um, because the new bodies have been designated as a as a local government body, the accounts commission have responsibility for auditing those, and that will continue to be a focus for our work in the next few years. Mr. Sinclair, just to, just add to the point that. The councillors and health board members appointed to the Joint Integration Board, their duty is to the best interest of the Joint Integration Board and to make maximum use of those resources, not to the council or the health board. It's like being appointed. If you're a councillor to a fire board or the police board, your duty is to watch to the fire board or the police board. I think that's going to be a bit of a steep learning curve, but that's the reality. And if they are going to make best use of the resources, they have to think about what are the, what's in the best interest of the users of service. and get to where we are, we are with that because it's trying to figure a way going forward. We know that we have major um, issues in terms of an ageing population. We know that the demand on services is coming at us faster and faster. I saw, for example, the, the, the Health uh, Cabinet Secretary last week being interviewed about Fife and being asked about the demands on, on services. And, and he basically said, yeah, it may be that, that Fife Council Social Work Service is is finding it hard to meet these growing demands. But the reality at the end of the day is that these demands are coming fast and furious. Local authorities, you know, is there not, we need some kind of reality check here that there's either going to have to be major investment coming in from the Scottish Government or, or there has to be something that clearly designates what this money is, is, is there and what it can achieve. Because it's fine coming up with all these other, other steps that you're talking about here, and it's fine coming up with a governance structure that says we... But unless we actually know that we're going to have the resources to provide the services... Well, I think the challenge for the integrated joint boards will be to make sure that they can demonstrate they're getting maximum value for money that's currently been spent separately by the Council and the Health Board, that by working together they can create, they can create um, a more effective and more efficient use of that money. Okay. Um, I, I want to pick up on a point, Mr Sinclair, because you said that, um, like uh, those members of uh, police boards and fire boards in the past, um, that uh, the members of the integration boards would be accountable to the board first and not to the, the local authority or the, uh, the health board that they represent. I think it was always the case when I was on a, a police board that uh, some elected members had uh, a great difficulty uh, in recognising uh, that uh, their first obligation when they were on the police board was uh, to the police board. And I think that came out in, in terms of the audits of the joint audits of boards uh, and forces, uh, which I think most of them came out pretty poorly. Um, I think Grampium was one of the better ones, if I remember rightly. How do we ensure that members, uh, whether they be from the health board or elected members from the local authority, recognise their obligations to, to these new bodies before uh, their case? The key to that is, is continuing, continuing training, continuing professional development for elected members. I mean, I, I, one of the points about somebody becomes a councillor, induction training at the beginning of their career is usually quite good. Councils are pretty good at providing induction training. But you, there's no penalty if you don't take up any other training as a councillor. There's no requirement in the Code of Conduct to say you must participate in training. Councils are complex organisations. They spend huge amounts of money. The, the way services are delivered, health and social care partnerships, ALIOS, the world out there is becoming even more complex. And it's even more important that councillors understand the roles that when they're appointed, say, as the chair of a finance committee or chair of an education committee um, or, or appointed to the board of Analio, that they understand what, what their obligations are and ensure that they have the necessary training to do it. I met recently uh, uh, a, an ex-councillor who had been appointed the vice chair of the, an education committee. I won't mention the name of the council. And I asked him what training had he received when he was appointed as vice chair of the education committee. None. Absolutely none. How can he effectively challenge the officers of the council if he d didn't have the skills and the knowledge to understand what the, the, um, the, the education service was trying to deliver? So I think, I think there's a real debate to be had as to whether uh, tra the training of councillors is, is adequate in, in the current climate. It was uh, 
Agreed. I, I thought that uh, in terms of the, the changes to, to pay and conditions for councillors that uh, training uh, would have to be taken. Um, you know, I think when that first came into play, uh, there was probably more training done in that first wee while than had ever been done in my entire time before uh, on a local authority, unless you sought out the training, of course, yourself. Uh, yourself, of course. And uh, I, I wonder, um, you know, uh, do you think that it would be wise if there was some uh, guidance, maybe even some legislation, to ensure um, that elected members do undertake the necessary training that's required for them to fulfil uh, their responsibilities? I certainly think there's a need for a debate about whether the current arrangements are fit for purpose. It's interesting the point you make, Camino, because way back in I think it was 2006, the Scottish Local Authorities Remuneration Committee recommended to government that there should be a standard job description for councillors and that all councillors should be required to undertake a training needs analysis and participate in training. That proposal was not taken up by the government of the day. They, they said councils should be encouraged to do it. I, 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 I just think there is an issue in there, given the complexity of the world in which a local government councillor operates in. I think it's really important for good democracy that councillors have the skills and the knowledge to be able to challenge officers on behalf of their constituents and, and ensure that the decisions are taken are, are well grounded and that they have the skills to, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, an ability to hold officers to account. Thank you. Mark McDonald, please. Uh, thank you, convener. And I think just to, to follow on from, from on that particular point as well, um, <clears throat> do you detect or have you done an analysis of training that is offered and training that is taken up by councillors at, at each local authority and <clears throat> are there areas or particular uh, councils where there is good uptake, bad uptake or is it a kind of same picture across the board? One of the reports we did a while ago in our How Councils Work series was roles and relationships, how you're getting it right and we define the different roles and relationships in, in councils. But I think we probably made the assumption that the training actually did happen for people to perform these roles. And one of the, one of the th current discussions within the Commission is whether we need to revisit that topic and go further into the into councils to understand what is the depth of the training that's been provided. It's easy for the Commission to say, you know, you understand your role as a councillor is the beginning and the end of the process. You set the strategy, you hold officers to account. But how do we, how, we, I don't think we've got the knowledge, my colleagues will correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think we've got the knowledge base to be able to say we know for a fact there's sufficient training being given to ensure that councillors can understand those roles and perform those roles. Um, equally, when someone, as I say, is appointed, say, a chair of a committee, something like a finance committee, what training is provided by the council to ensure that person can do the job properly? Uh, I, I, th I, think, I think there's a further piece of work that we need to get into to understand how good is the quality of training in, in our 32 councils. Mr McKinley and then Mr Smeal, please. I think, I think as, as the Chair says, that would be a very interesting piece of work to look right across the piece. We do pick it up routinely when we're doing work in individual councils, um, so it's, it's a good indication of, in best value audits, for example, where we talk about the kind of political leadership that's um, uh, provided in a council the extent to which training is offered and indeed taken up and I think it's it's patchy at best and, and to be fair to the officer core if you like very often they are leading the horses to water and the, the horses aren't drinking it you know they, they, there have been lots of moves I think particularly over recent years to to think about different times when members can make it to, to think about topics to think about packaging it around um, you know council meetings when they're there anyway so there are there are moves and efforts to make it, at the end of the day, councillors need to turn up and, and do it. And I think there's been movement on that, and I think there's still a long way to go. And as the Chair says, we may well be revisiting that whole discussion about the role of the elected member, um, which, as the Chair says, has has changed and is increasingly complex and challenging. I think we'll probably want to revisit that in the next couple of years. Mr Smale, please. Um, well, one of the points I want to raise is exactly as, uh, as Fraser said there about the onus and councillors to recognise that there's a need for them to ensure that they're up to date with these things, as everyone was saying here at the table, a very quickly changing and complex situation that councillors are in. Uh, the, the other point I want to add is the improvement service itself does a, a survey of councillors to get a sense of uptake of training and development. Um, 
they do that quite regularly, so that gives us some information. You asked, one of the particular areas I think that keeps coming up is the degree to which elected members are supported in scrutiny. Um, and it's really just the, this whole point about, firstly, the overall environment. Do you understand how your council works? But the secondly, I think there's more uh, in-depth type of training about um, getting past the first question, if you like, when there's scrutiny going on at a particular committee. What's the supplementary question? What's the next thing that really gets to the root of the issue, whether it's to do with with the finances of the council or whether it's to do with service performance. So that, um, that, that training, I think, would really be helpful to councillors is to take that next step and it's vital in the governance arrangements. Mr Macdonald back in, could, could you maybe give us an indication of how uh, many, what percentage of councillors respond to that improvement service questionnaire? Because, you know, uh, my own uh, experience of that kind of situation is the the, uh, the folks who respond to these kind of things are the, the folks who are desperate for, for more training and uh, those who uh, uh, are not that interested don't respond to these things normally. Yeah. We, I don't have the figures with me just now. There's a passing reference to this, the survey at paragraph 37 of the report. Um, and as we say there, of those who responded, which I think picks up the very point you're making, uh, there's a reference there to the, the induction and, and to scrutiny as well. I think it's that scrutiny point that was coming through quite strongly. Uh, Mr. McDonald. Uh, thank you, Convener. Moving away from that to the issue around following the public pound, um, I'm sure while the Press and Journal is at the very top of all your reading lists, you won't have necessarily seen today's edition. And it reports that the chair of the Youth Festival Trust in Aberdeen has resigned, claiming that there are not uh, appropriate uh, reports to show how the public pound is being used by that trust, and also concerns around what she describes as a political agenda within that trust, which I think gets back to the point the convener was making around what interests are being followed when elected members are sitting as members of trusts and boards. How, how do you feel that, you know, generally across Scotland, whether it's an, an, an alio or, or, an, or a trust or a board where elected members are, are, are sitting as board members, how, how do you feel that the relationship in terms of the reporting um, at board level uh, is compared to you know the the, the role that councillors would would have in terms of looking at the the finance reports at a finance committee uh, versus the reports they're being uh, exposed to as it were when they're on these boards and trusts is there a, a disconnect there between the detail that's being provided do you find from what you see who wants to go first in that one mr mckinley um, so the PNJ is very much on our reading list every day. I haven't quite managed to catch it's, today's. It's actually uh, the front page of the Herald as well. Um, I haven't quite managed to pick it up today, Mr. Yeah. McDonald, but I'll, I'll definitely pick up on that one. I think the, the so that situation you described is one that we come across, um, and I think, it, like many of these things, it varies enormously across um, the country. I think the whole question of alios and following the public pound is obviously an area that the committee has been interested in for a long time, and the commission are. Uh, are two, and we are in the middle of doing uh, a further piece of work which we'll be reporting back to the Commission in the autumn, which is really, first of all, trying to get just a better understanding of what the alios picture is out there, because one of the challenges we've had in the past is actually, first of all, trying to define what an alio is, because it, that phrase covers an enormously wide range of, of, of organisations, and then also to try and get under the skin of what are the governance arrangements around those alios, what does that look like, what is the reporting relationship between the alio and the council how does the council while recognizing that the board of the alio whether it's a company whether it's a charity whether that board is uh, responsible for the governance of that organization the council has a duty in terms of base value and following the public pound and all those things so what is the relationship there and we'll be coming back to the commission in, in autumn and um, so there, there is a very big question around that it's worth pointing out that um, and reminding ourselves that alios, whatever status they are, are audited by auditors. Now, not by us, always, um, and the board or, of that charity or that company uh, need to appoint auditors and they do an audit of the financial statements um, following the same kind of international accounting and auditing standards as we do. But, but there's no doubt that it is, if you like, out with the direct um, uh, remit of the public audit system, if you like, but in a sense, that's kind of deliberate because they're arm's length, and that's in a sense um, part of the point in the exercise. So, so the Commission have, be, have been thinking hard about this. They've asked us to think hard about how do we ensure that the existing powers that we have collectively are used to ensure that there is 
um, good governance around following the public pound, and that's another piece of work um, that we're that we're doing at the moment. Could I just add to that? I think it, I just make the point, uh, and maybe you didn't mean this, that in the sense that alios are not as good as councils. I think I'd just make the qualification that the scrutiny and governance arrangements in all 32 councils are not always that good. There are a number of councils where the scrutiny arrangements are not good. For example, where the chair of the scrutiny early committee is not is a member of the administration. Now, the commission firmly believes as a principle of good governance, and in terms of public confidence, that the chair of the scrutiny committee should never be a member of the administration, should always be a member of the opposition. We also find in some situations where the representation on the scrutiny committee doesn't reflect the result of the election. I can think of one council where one party was represented by one person on the scrutiny committee, therefore wasn't able to have a second or a motion. Are you with me? Uh, uh, but that didn't reflect the result of the committee. Now, in England, the law is very clear that the results of an election must be reflected in, in the allocation of seats on committees and subcommittees. That part of the law doesn't apply in Scotland. Where I was going with that, the, yep. the, the, I'll quote from the article that the, um, the council's corporate accounting manager said trustees receive a number of different finance reports which make it exceedingly difficult to be accurately appraised of the true financial position. So that was really where I was coming from mm. was the, 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 the amount and level of information that is often provided, particularly, at, uh, you know, I'm not suggesting the Youth Festival Trust is a small trust because it's mm. not, but there are some trusts and boards yeah. on which elected members sit which are not huge in terms of the budget they're dealing with but nonetheless it's important to ensure that the public pound however much of it is being allocated is being followed and tracked appropriately or mr mcdonald mr smell do you want to come back and then mr well, sinclair i was just a, it was to go back to the general yeah. councils on Adalio, so i don't know i don't want to interrupt the i'm just going to make one okay. point i think it's really important when the council sets up an alley of it's dealing with complex financial issues, that it ensures there's the expertise on the ALIO board. If councils, councillors don't have it to ensure that they appoint someone from the outside world who has that expertise and skills to be able to challenge the officers and to hold them to account. Mr Smale, do you want to just, go back to that point about a, a couple of points about the, the generality of ALIOs and touching on Mr McDonald's point about scrutiny and availability of information. Uh, the Commission, uh, as part of its How Councils Work series, uh, back in 2011, did a, a report on um, alios, uh, bringing together a lot of these principles and we, we had two parts of the report which was getting it right from the start and keeping it right and our experience in this overview report this year refers to one particular case involving the Highland Council where things didn't go well with an alio, Caithness, Heat and Power and a lot of that to do was to do with the extent to which the council councillors had a full understanding of the financial position in that alio. So my, my point being that um, there's a there, quite often when we are asked to come and look at an alio that perhaps had had problems, um, we find that things have not been set up from the start. There is no sort of questioning about is this the right way for us to do things. As an elected member, am I getting the right information that I need to make that judgment? And finally, your point I think was well made as well about the uh, degree of money that's involved. I mean, quite often uh, it's uh, the the risks are. Um, not to do with the larger alios, which have got all the machinery of governance round about them, with financial people on both sides, if you like, in the in the alio and in the council. So, what we would encourage is a, a sort of risk-based approach from councils when they're setting up and working with alios to get that right from the start, to get it commensurate with the risk that they see to the public money that's involved. Yeah. Well, one final question, and you'll. You Forgive me for again being somewhat parochial, but there we are. Um, you'll be aware that Aberdeen City Council have established an arm's length company to deal with social care, Bon Accord Care. Uh, no councillors sit on the board of that arm's length company, and there are concerns around the uh, ability, therefore, of the council to scrutinise the way in which money is being spent by that arm's length company. Is this something that's on the radar of either Audit Scotland or the Accounts Commission at present to, to look at and determine whether the scrutiny arrangements that are in place there are appropriate given the sums of money involved? And I realise we're, we're talking about large sums of money, but nonetheless. Um, absolutely, and it's a principal issue around the, the, the governance of Alios. As Fraser was saying, I mean, we're looking at it from the uh, council perspective, that's, that's the end of the telescope we're looking at here, but it's really important that these things are set up correctly from the start. We're hoping that the work we're doing just now in Alios will bring forward, tie up to the earlier conversation about good practice, because some councils have got fairly well-established processes for dealing with Alios overall. 
One of the problems we find quite often is that there is an inconsistency about how an a council is overseeing its alios and that this issue about making sure that things are done properly and across the piece. So if the council uh, decides, for example, in that case, that that's the way they want to have representation, in this case, none, um, what, what discussions have had about how it will oversee the use of the money? And, and to make the point, it's not just about how the money's been used, it's also about the performance they get for that money. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk about following the public pound, and for yeah. me that misses the point to an extent, because it's the quality of the services mm -hmm. that are also being achieved from that public pound. It doesn't matter whether the public pound's been spent by the council directly or through an alio, I think that's the important point. And the fact is the council remains responsible for the money and the quality of the service, irrespective of the fact it's been provided by the alio. So the obligation doesn't go away. Okay. Cameron Buchanan, please. Thank you. I want to go back. Thank you. Um, I want to go back to a point about on paragraph 111, saying ensure that all partners align their service and financial planning arrangements. Could you expand on that, please? Um, certainly. I think the point we're making here is that um, community planning in the past has been, at best, um, an effort for the individual partners who have their own plans and their own spending priorities and their own budgets to come together at some point and say, how can we kind of join these up? Or at best, how can we make sure that we're not you know, falling over each other's or missing bits? So there's that kind of individual partners will do all their budget planning, service planning, and then come to the table. I think what the latest driver in community planning is trying to shift is, if you like, having that conversation much earlier. So before budgets are set, before individual plans are set in the health board or the council, they should be having a conversation around the community planning table that says what are the outcomes we're trying to deliver for our local communities and how best can we work together or indeed separately to achieve those outcomes. So I guess what we're trying to uh, get at there is bringing that discussion much earlier in the planning cycle rather than just trying to you know, knit it together once, once the plans have been set by the individual bodies. Thank you very much. Can I just also come to another point? Yes, Thank sure. you. Um, dealing with the equal pay claims that you're talking about there, um, you've, you've got some money set aside for it. Are you still expecting an awful lot of um, equal pay claims to come up? I mean, it seems a huge amount that you've got set aside. Surely we've got this sort of organised by now, have we not? I'll ask Gordon to come in in, in a moment. Um, right. uh, and Thankfully, it's not us that has to set aside the money, Mr. Uh, Buchanan, but, but I, I know what you mean. And, and I'm reluctant to say, well, hopefully, no more, because it feels like we've been saying that for quite a long time. Um, so, I, I mean, in principle, I'll ask Gordon to talk to detail in a second, but there's no doubt that equal pay continues to be one of the biggest uh, risks and issues that councils face. We're having a conversation with the Accounts Commission um, just in the next couple of weeks about whether there's anything more we might do in that. We currently our auditors will look at the provisions that are made in individual councils for equal pay claims, and we do an assessment about whether that seems reasonable or not. But pretty much that's the extent of our involvement in it at the moment. I think there are some interesting bigger questions about how single status and equal pay has gone in local government uh, over the last, whatever we are now, 10, 12, 15 years, Mr Wilson. Thank you. So um, there's a kind of bigger question, which I think we are now uh, in a position to, to ask ourselves. I think councils are doing their best to get these things resolved. It's very susceptible to case law. So just at the point in which you think mm. we've got it all stitched down, there's a case from Birmingham or wherever it happens to be, which opens up a whole raft of new cases. So it's a constantly evolving and very complex legal picture. Um, I'll, I'll ask Gordon to say a little bit about the, the sums involved, maybe. Can, can I just, before Gordon comes in, just make two points. The Commission's interest that Fraser touched on, I think we have probably two issues of interest. One. Whether, whether councils um, did sufficient risk assessments before they got into this business. And secondly, whether there's been a sufficient trade-off between the huge amounts of money in equal pay, over £500 million already, and a trade-off in terms of modernising conditions of service, and whether councils have made, the, have, have made the most of that opportunity, I think is a question mark that the, the Commission are interested in. Yeah. Really, just to, to pick up on the financial side of things, each year when the, the audits have been done of the, of the accounts, um, the auditors will look at the figures that are brought forward by councils in terms of the money that should have set aside, where there's a, 
um, a degree of certainty about how much is going to have to be paid out. And then there's another uh, element to that where, where there's more uncertainty, which we would call contingent liabilities. And the figures there in the, the report show this is starting to nudge up towards £600 million. Pounds. So a substantial amount of money. There is a, an ongoing degree of uncertainty, as Fraser was saying. The only other point I would uh, make is, as we say in the report, is um, we shouldn't lose sight of the amount of time that is, uh, you know, officers of councils are having to spend in this, you know, uh, HR departments. One of the things we say quite often in best value uh, audits is the degree to which councils have uh, got a, a full um, workforce plan, so they've got a, a sense of what they need in terms of the numbers of people going ahead for services. A lot of the people that are involved in that type of work are also involved in dealing with uh, resolving the uh, equal pay element of things. So there's, there is a, a wider impact than, than, if you like, simply the, the financial aspects of this, which in themselves are substantial. Cameron, do you want to come back? Okay. John Wilson, please. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, gentlemen. I wasn't going to cover these two issues at the start, but given they've been raised, I just want to clarify for everyone. I know that the report refers to equal pay, but when we, and I think Mr. McKinley quite rightly identified it's equal pay and single status, which were two different settlements that were combined by many local authorities to actually be one debate about equal pay, whereas single status in 2005 added into the whole complexity of equal pay. When you've indicated that you may be doing some work, Mr Smell, in terms of the, how local authorities have handled the equal pay and single uh, status negotiations, discussions and settlements, could I request that you also uh, look at the amount of external funding uh, the local authorities have actually had to apply for legal advice on many of these cases because I know there are authorities who have spent substantial amounts of uh, public money on external legal advice to mitigate against some of the uh, equal pay and single status claims that have been made. Okay. 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 Right. Thank you. Thank you. That's that first point, convener. The second point is the education and training of councillors. And I've raised this before in the, uh, this committee, convener, when this report has been produced. We seem to take account or take little account of the expertise, the ec educational achievement of some of the councillors that we have uh, in place. And this was something that came up just after the 2012 and 2007 elections. I've got a copy of the Improvement Service report that was done uh, in the consultation with the councillors, where roughly 26% of the councillors responded. And what we've got in terms of education and employment is the Improvement Service says that over 50% of the elected members who responded to this have got a degree or higher qualifications, and if you take it in terms of postgraduate qualifications, over 60% of elected members are actually have the qualifications at that level. And I've had it said to me on a number of occasions by elected members who have been invited along to participate in the training being delivered by a local authority that the quality and standard of training is so poor they felt they could actually deliver it themselves. Uh, and when you're looking at training uh, for elected members, it may be worthwhile uh, considering whether or not the standard of training being provided is sufficient and the quality is sufficient for the elect some of the elected members that are already there. And part of the reason why elected members may not be participating may be because of the quality uh, of the training uh, and they feel that they actually have already have that experience. We also have another problem. We have got councillors who have been there for over 30 years who think they've been through it all and know it all and therefore don't need to participate in the training. I, uh, I think there's a very, when you make a very good point that, that, that councillors should be more involved in the design of the training. I think, um, as I mentioned earlier, I think councils are pretty good at induction training. But after that, the, the, there isn't the continuous professional development of councillors in ways that they would find helpful, in ways that they can influence the design of the, the courses and, and training that they need. I think that's a, that's a, that would be a useful point for, for us to explore in any further work we do on this. Thank you. I, I think the other thing, would, uh, another idea would be to allow 
uh, councillors to choose training themselves from a menu. Yeah. Um, and often that will be from external sources. But sometimes that comes in a, a lot cheaper than some of the internal uh, stuff or IS stuff. Alec, you've got a supplementary on this point. I mean, is, is there a balance to be struck given that local government is exactly that? Government is elected by the people um, and these people are elected and they're accountable at the ballot box at the end of the day. So in terms of training, there is, is there a danger that you can start to look at the professionalisation of the councillor? And I certainly would like to raise that. And my own experience is that where you've had, for example, somebody who was a council official, say a, a head of service or whatever, becoming a councillor and thinking they're an expert in the area that they came from, it doesn't always, always um, follow suit. And you gave the, the, the example earlier if you're the chairman of a finance committee, but I would argue if you're the chairman of a finance committee, it doesn't necessarily follow suit that you need to be an accountant. Indeed, far from it, because you're surrounded by accountants. So, so I think you know, that it's, it's not as, it's as straightforward as, 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 as perhaps it would first seem. No, I, I, I take the point, and I, you know, I think it's, we all recognise that when councillors are appointed, they have different different expectations and, and different ambitions and many councillors are happy simply being uh, the advocate on behalf of the constituent and enjoy that work and have no desire to become a chair or a vice chair. Uh, I think it's important that they, we give them the training to do that job effectively and the support so that councillors' time is used effectively and there is the right support that they're not having to do work that can be done on their behalf by officers but equally there will be some councillors and there need to be some councillors who want to be form part of the administration and ensure they have the necessary skills to do their job as in chairing committees and, and, and ensuring that they can hold officers to account. I don't think it, that needs a professional background, but it does need the skills in chairing a committee and knowing when to write, when to ask and how to ask the right questions. Another supplementary from Cameron Buchanan, Thank and then we'll be back to Mr Wilson. Thank you. Do you have the powers to monitor the training, to control the training no. at all? No. no our, 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 our function is audit. And what we, if we were going to do a further piece of work, we would do a follow-up report to a report on roles and relationship, dig down um, further into the quality of training, the, the kind of questions that Mr Wilson asked, how, how effective is the training, what's the quality of it, how satisfied are members, do they understand the roles and relationship, and then we would present that report to the local government community and we would expect them to pick it up. Okay. Well, the, the other issue, and I'm, I'm glad we've had the discussion on training because I think it is important. The, the other difficulty is, as I've said previously at this committee, is sometimes the appointment of chairs or vice chairs of committees is not uh, the best person that's appointed. Is sometimes politically motivated in terms of who the chair or the, the vice chair of a com particular committee is rather than the best person to chair it. But moving on, convener, there, there is an issue and a wider issue and a note from the chair's opening remark in uh, paragraph 9 but he says this report is mainly for councillors. I think this report uh, and the report uh, produced by the Audit Commission should be for everyone, mm -hmm. because particularly the public. Because I think there is an issue about elected member accountability, and it's not just accountability at the ballot box. I think there has to be accountability for the decisions that are being made. Uh, and that leads me on to the question about the alios and Mr. Smale and Mr. McKinley know my particular interest uh, in the operation of alios in Scotland and how different local authorities take different courses. But there, fundamentally to that is about the accountability of the decision making and following the public pound, as Mr. Smale indicated, in relation to how that money is allocated in alio. And I think Mr. McDonald raised the issue about Bon Accord. We, uh, Keith Neff, Heat and Power was mentioned earlier. But there is a, a serious concern that many of the public feel decisions are being made by local authorities uh, to transfer services. And I know the service that was mentioned in your report refers to leisure services. Mr. McDonald made reference to care services. And I know that Glasgow and other local authorities have transferred what would be seen as a crucial service for everyone, care, being transferred to alios, and whether or not there is proper scrutiny of the public pound and how these decisions are being made by local authorities uh, in relation to holding accountable the money that's being invested in those services. Mm -hmm. Who's going to tackle that one? 
Mr um, McKinley. So I think the, the, the Accounts Commission's position and, and our position on it in Scotland, I think, is very similar to the one you set out in your report on local government autonomy and flexibility, which is if you are setting up an ALIO, it needs to be very clearly based on a strong business case, both in terms of the finances and the um, uh, service, uh, and it needs to be transparent and accountability needs to be absolutely clear. And I think the reason that the Bon Accord one has been on, on our radar uh, since its inception and similarly in Glasgow is that it, it, they are interesting and in it does get into services to more vulnerable people. Now, that's not to diminish the importance of leisure services, but it does feel different, and so we are acutely aware of those things. I think it's also worth just remembering that um, we do have organisations like the Care Inspectorate who, who will still be inspecting the quality of care provided by those services as they do the private sector as well. So we do need to remind ourselves that as allios, they're not completely out with the realms of public scrutiny. But I absolutely take the point, Mr Wilson, in terms of how the money is spent and democratic accountability. And importantly, as a service user of a leisure centre or a care service or whatever it is, if things don't go wrong, who am I, who's my problem with? Who am I complaining to? And that, I think, just isn't clear to a lot of people. They're not interested in the intricacies of mm. the fact that it's been set up as an LLP or a trust or on anything else. Most people would recognise their local leisure centre as a council-run thing, and if they're not happy with it, they'll pick up the phone to their councillor. Um, now, that is, is kind of the nature of the beast, and I think what we can help with is ensuring that the clarity of the roles and responsibilities and governance are as clear as they can be, um, and beyond that, making sure that those those systems are are in place as best we can. So, so the point is absolutely well made. As I say, we are continuing to help the Accounts Commission figure out what, if anything, more we need to do around those things, um, while being reasonably comfortable at the moment that our existing powers in terms of best value and following the public pound would allow us to go into these places if if there was any, uh, you know, if any problems came to light. Okay. I think I just add to that we shouldn't lose sight of the importance of the responsibilities of the chief executive of the council and the, the section 95 officer, the director of finance. They've got obligations to ensure that public money is is carefully used. I was hoping to raise section 95 later on, convener, right. but just to concentrate on the issue about alios and the decisions of local authorities. Mr. McKinley made reference to. And you gave an example of leisure services, if there's something wrong, a member of the public would pick up the phone and phone their local councillor. In many respects, local councillors don't have any say or any control in terms of how these services are being delivered. The public money is paying for that service, but under the council structures, because it's an alio, there is no direct accountability to the council or council committees. Now, I can give you an example of, and I have given you an example previously, of a local authority where the convener of the main leisure and services committee is also the convener of the ALIO. So when it comes to an issue being raised by, say, an opposition councillor or a member of their own party, then that debate is usually shut down. And when someone asks for a vote on a decision, the vote is usually shut down. There's no roll call votes taken. There's no indication of dissension being recorded. How do we ensure the democratic process within local authorities is being fully upheld when debate, scrutiny and accountability is being shut down uh, by the very people who are sitting on the ALIO boards, which have already indicated are accountable to the ALIO board, not necessarily to the council? I think you've made some recommendations in this in the past, Mr McKinley, if memory serves me well. Yeah, and as Gordon mentioned earlier, convener, the report the Commission produced back in 2011, which tried to set out exactly these things, Mr Wilson, where if you, if you are setting up an ALIO, this is, these are the kinds of things you need to consider. And, and if there are examples where that isn't working well, then obviously we would, we would want to pick up on those. And it's not straightforward. You know, that, the, the challenge of if you're a councillor sitting on a board of an alio and at the same time having feeling that you are responsible for the council is a really difficult thing to do wearing those two hats is really is really very challenging it, it kind of comes with the territory and our, our best advice is for the councillors themselves to take advice um, about how they manage those those potentially conflicting roles and at some point i think we say in that original report gordon that 
it may be that the conflicts become irreconcilable and you feel that you can't do both. And at that point, they have to make quite a tricky decision about um, what, what they do there. Uh, so it's not, it's not straightforward. I think you guys have actually made recommendations previously to councils where there, these conflicts have taken place. Is that not the case? Yeah. Um, in terms of councils who have had folk on alios, leisure ones, um, who were also scrutinising that alio in particular subcommittees of education and leisure committees, um, and I believe that you gave the recommendation that that shouldn't be the case. Scrutinising yourself. You, you'll probably remember better than I do, convener. I don't remember that specific one, um, but we'll certainly double check. And and certainly in, in examples like Case and S Heat and Power, obviously the Commission made lots of, of good recommendations for for that particular case and more widely uh, about learning the lessons from what was a very expensive example of how alios sometimes don't work. Okay, Mr. Wilson, yes, sorry about that. Last question, convener. And there are a number more, but I'll just restrict myself to my final one. Just to, on Mr Sinclair's point about the Section 95 officer of the local authority, in your report you indicate the officer responsible for finance is often not sitting on the key structure that makes the policy decide, or policy recommendations, I should say, because it's the councillors who make decisions, it's the officers who carry out the councillors' decisions, that, that, which is something I've still to see happening in many local authorities, but that, that's another debate for another day. But in relation to the Section 95 officer and the role of the Section 95 officer, would, and I don't, know you don't recommend it in your report, but how do you see the Section 95 officer influencing the key decisions or the key discussions that are taking place at a senior officer level within the council if that Section 95 officer is not there to guide them and only is then being asked to carry out decisions that have been made without their input in the initial discussions. Mr Smale. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, 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 a common issue for the Accounts Commission and, uh, you know, again, when things don't go right, it's quite often to do with uh, just where the Section 95 officer sits. The Commission, I think, has taken a, 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 the right approach here, which is not for the Commission to determine what senior management structures look like in councils, but the principle is extremely important. And that is about recognising the role of the Section 95 officer, separate statutory role there uh, for, with responsibility for all aspects of the Council's finances. Where the management structures and the, the movement in most Councils over the, in recent times has been to smaller senior management teams you know, in, 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 as part of the drive to save money, is where the Section 95 officer is not at the top table. What the Commission is saying, and Audit Scotland is, is saying this through its work as well, is that Council should satisfy themselves that the Section 95 officer has his or her place regardless of where they sit in the structure. Partly this is to do as well with, to tie it up with the earlier conversations we had about councillor training. One of the things we quite often find when we speak to councillors is, is there a recognition of who, who the Section 95 officer is, what that person does? I can say that must, can also be extended to the other statutory officers like monitoring officers, just to say that in passing. But to stick with the Section 95 officer, who is it, what is the role? Um, and the fact that that individual should be available to elected members for that independent expert advice that would assist them understanding some of the things that are coming through in terms of some of, for example, some of the very complicated financing structures for capital that are starting to develop. So absolutely key role um, and one that uh, we will continue through audit uh, to support as, uh, as, as absolutely crucial to the governance of councils. Okay. Stuart McMillan, please. Thank you, convener. That's, uh, it just follows on from the, the question regarding the, the governance um, the scenario. Um, a couple of points have been raised earlier. One was regarding legislation in England. And, uh, and recently, uh, Mr McKinley uh, mentioned uh, two words of it, to recommend and advice. Uh, so in terms of the alios, um, would it be your recommendation or is it something that you've thought about in terms of going forward uh, for Scotland to actually have a more, uh, to have a stricter uh, framework to have a, a legislation brought in to, 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 uh, to ensure that the direction of travel for future alios is one whereby uh, what's happened up to now actually can continue so that there actually is a better level of scrutiny uh, from councillors and councils uh, regarding the, the alios in their areas. Mr Sinclair. 
think we'd have to. I mean, I, I, I hear what you say, Mr. McGrath. I think we'd have to await the uh, audit Scotland report that comes to the Commission later this year, and the Commission can then take a view as to what further work it, it wishes to be undertaken, or what recommendations it wants to take. I, I don't think it would be right for me to prejudge that work, but I do understand the point you're making. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, just, uh, another question that's uh, just is regarding. Uh, it was paragraph four of the report and also key message six uh, on the issue of political tensions. Um, I, I must admit, when I read this, I did actually have a wee chuckle to myself um, because at the end of the day, um, people who are elected from different parties, uh, they're in different parties for, uh, for various reasons, so they're not always going to agree with uh, other people. So, um, so uh, it could be suggested that, um, that, that that would actually be a normal state of affairs but the fact that you've raised it in this report, uh, are you indicating that, uh, that you've maybe seen uh, kind of a, a, an increased level uh, of the political tensions um, within local authorities? Or are, are you suggesting that uh, the situation uh, is maybe worse now compared to maybe, say, 10 years ago or 15 years ago? Mr Sinclair? Uh, I, I, no, I, I think what we're trying to draw attention to is the fact that the Code of Conduct is quite clear that all councillors have a duty to maintain public trust and confidence in the integrity of the council. Best value guidance is also upholding the high standards of probity and propriety. I, I, you're absolutely right to say that politics is the cut and thrust of local government. It's when it gets to, a stream, to an extreme when the uh, only news coming out of the council is about squabbles rather than about services, and the public begin to lose confidence and trust in the, in the, in the council and say, well, you know, the council are not serving the people, all they're doing is infighting. I think that's when the Commission feels it's appropriate to express its concern when the council's um, leadership uh, on behalf of the community is, 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 is being, um, how can I put it, is being dis disdirected into infighting and squabbles. So, so certainly, uh, from what you're saying from the support, uh, you're indicating that that's actually, that that's on the increase. Is that correct? We, we've certainly found in, in a number of councils that that's been, a, that's been an issue that's, that's diverted the, uh, the energy of the council into, this, into what we would regard as the appropriate business of the council. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Mr McKinley, just, yeah. Just briefly, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think what's interesting about this year is that we've, um, I think for the last couple of years, we've, we've kind of highlighted the risk and, the, and or a requirement for political leadership and indeed officer leadership to be effective and to to work in the best interests in the council. As you say, we've gone a bit further this year because the evidence coming through from some local audit work was stronger about, and we do, as, as the chair says, set a very high bar for this. This isn't the kind of routine um, political back and, uh, and forwards which we would expect and welcome, and as uh, the chair says, is, is what local government's all about. But it's the point at which it, it actually begins to get in the way of council business that we think it's legitimate for the reasons the chair uh, has said to comment on it. Um, and it's not been universally popular that we've commented on it, I have to say, um, but we think it's important and, um, and you know, I think um, we'll obviously be keeping a, continue to keep a close eye on it, but, but be assured, Ms McMillan, that this, we, you know, we only comment on it when we really think it's creating a problem. Okay, Stuart. I think yeah, I, I was, I was, Mr. Was, sorry, it was exactly the same point I wanted to emphasise that this is this is a it's an audit report based on evidence, and mm. um, it's right that if we see a pattern starting to emerge of this type of thing starting to come through, I think also just to keep it in context, um, I don't think we see looking ahead, and we're encouraged to look ahead as best we can based on the evidence we have, is with finances becoming tighter decisions are going to become more difficult and therefore it's likely to add to that, uh, you know, the, the, the tensions, the political debate in councils. So it's really just to flag that up so that, um, I don't know, that there's an increased awareness of the consequences of when this can go over the point where it's an acceptable exchange about differences about policies and actually affecting the business of the council. So in other words, I think looking ahead, you know, the, the, the environment is going to become even more difficult for councils as he's trying to deal with the, the fin financial constraints and other pressures such as demands on services. Uh, do you think your colleagues in the Standards Commission could be a bit more helpful in terms of dealing with some of the uh, difficulties that there are out there? I'm sure they're very helpful on these things. That's very diplomatic, <laughs> very diplomatic. Stuart. Oh, thank you. It's uh, just uh, one final question. It's really just a, a point of clarification. In paragraph 17, 
uh, where you talk about the, also the equal pay. Um, I think my colleague John Wilson mentioned 15 years earlier. Uh, so that this, uh, the £507 million, um, is that over that 15-year period? It is. It's the it's bill. We, what we've been doing is monitoring the, the cost to councils of equal, of equal pay and, and impl implementing uh, the requirements of that, and that's the build-up over the years, yes. Sure. Okay, thank you. Right. Uh, Mr Rowley and Mr Wilson want to come back in. Could you be very brief, please, gentlemen? Mr Rowley. Yeah, what work is, is, is ongoing in terms of looking at capital projects um, in terms of, I mean, as a former councillor, I certainly found it difficult. Um, Carnegie Leisure Centre came in about 11 million, ended up costing 21 million and still rising. And, and I, I found it really difficult because I was often advised by officers that, that you know, companies were coming in with lower tenders. Um, th there was legalities would come into it, there would be claims made, etc. Um, that's not always the case, and I know that, that some of the, the work that's coming in through Hubco is, 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 is producing better. But where are we at with that, and how is that being monitored? Because that's somewhere I think councillors find it very difficult um, when they're being told that there is all these legal issues and challenges and whatever. But a lot of public sector contracts spiral out of control. Who wants to tackle that one? Mr. Smale. Yeah, very briefly, we uh, uh, um, relatively recently, in the last couple of years, looked at major capital projects in councils and looked at the, uh, some of the issues about why there was uh, overspending slippage in programmes as well. Um, what we do um, with some of these major uh, reports that we do is we come back and have a look at it. And in fact, uh, auditors are doing work this year to find out how that report's actually been used in individual councils. So we'll be bringing that back together for a report for the Commission to, to, to see what's moved on, what's still, not, uh, what's still not working well, and then we'll consider, I guess, as part of our programme, what more we can do through work for the Commission to support that. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Wilson. Just in the issue of the Disputes that are taking place in council chambers over decisions that have been made, particularly in tight financial constraints. Do you think there should, or is it the accounts commission's view that there should be more openness and transparency in terms of the decision-making process, including the recording of the votes cast by members when it comes to decisions in the chamber and at committee? <coughs> I think that's a, that's a matter, I don't mean to duck this, I think that's a matter for each council. But I think it's important that councils, and considering what their arrangements are, they need to ensure that the, the arrangements they put in place command the trust of the, and confidence of the public. That's the key test for all councils to ask themselves. Okay, uh, two final points for myself. One about procurement. Um, obviously, uh, you, you state a £5 billion bill. Uh, and you look at the, the local government situation very closely indeed. Do you have any remit to look at uh, joint procurement bodies such as Scotland Excel and the work that you're doing? Um, the, the report we produced uh, on procurement uh, this, this year, yep. um, in April of this year, convener looked at the spend in local government and included uh, a, a lot of commentary about the role of Scotland Excel in there because it's an important part of how local government now procures services. So, um, so we have done a report on that very recently and it will continue to be a thing we'll keep an eye on. I have to go back and have a look at that. It seems to have I would recommend memory. it, Convener. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, finally, um, 102 um, uh, in your report talks about pri priority-based uh, budgeting. Uh, we've heard from local authorities that... Um, that they have embarked in some cases in this, and then you probe and you find that priority-based budgeting means in one sector of their business only and, and not the, the rest. Uh, where are we moving on that? Uh, and beyond that, um, I'd welcome comment on long-term or longer-term financial planning and where councils are at, at with those um, medium-term, long-term financial strategies. Mr. Smale. The, the first point about budgeting, um, absolutely, it's, it's, uh, priority based budgeting is, is not an easy thing to do. However, um, the position we are in public finances, in fact, uh, we published the, the, the Commission, the Auditor General published the report just in June, uh, a couple of months back. Um, 
looking at how public finances were at, what the position was and what's been done to move things forward. And one of the areas we looked at was budget setting. And the clear conclusion there is that most public bodies, including councils, take an incre incremental traditional approach to budgeting. And that's fine when there are gradual increases in the money that's available. Uh, Zero-based budgeting and, and the, the, the thing we're talking about here, priority-based budgeting, is um, a lot more difficult to do, but it's, it's becoming essential. It's not good enough to continue with the salami slicing approach. We're, we're coming to a stage now, if we've not already reached it, where there needs to be a more fundamental view when budgets are set about what it is people are trying to achieve. It's not easy to do. It's more time consuming, but it is absolutely essential if councils and other public bodies are going to deal with the uh, continuing pressures and looking ahead to 16, 17, 17, 18, the prospect of, 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 of further and uh, more significant reductions in public money. On the long-term financial planning, it's another area we looked at as part of that Scotland's public finances uh, work that I mentioned. Um, councils, uh, I think, are probably doing more in terms of the medium-term financial planning. They're looking further ahead. In terms of longer-term financial planning, by which I mean looking at the five to ten year uh, type of time, uh, there's very few councils. I think it's a order of about five councils, I think, we identified that were, were claiming that they were they were starting to look further ahead. Um, absolutely, as you'd expect to say, absolutely essential, not least because with the impact of um, some of the mechanisms for, for uh, capital financing, um, more and more the flexibility in budgets is, is reducing. In other words, when you sit down with your you know, the sheet of paper, you've got to put increasing number of things in straight away mm -hmm. to meet the costs of previous decisions about how to finance capital. So if you take the combination of uh, the, the, the need to, the need to change, change the approach to budget, some of the references we have in this report, the overview report to uh, borrowing and reserves, absolutely points to the need for longer term financial planning. It's not easy, but I think it's, it's absolutely critical if uh, the public sector and councils are to, are to deal with the challenges they face in future. Some of your past decisions that you're talking about are things like PPP schools and things like that, where you know, yeah, or, yeah. or, or additional borrowing. Yeah, that's been absolutely. Taken. Can, can I ask? And uh, uh, it's it's a small request, uh, uh, but I think it would be extremely useful. Um, uh, is that there be some uh, definition set by yourselves about what priority-based budgeting is, what zero-based budgeting is, what medium-term financial planning is? what long-term financial planning is. One of the things which we find, uh, we've definitely found of late at this committee, is you will ask somebody about priority-based budgeting, for example. They will say that they're doing it, and then you'll find that that is extremely restricted, um, and it's not really priority-based budgeting at all, and yet they seem to think that is exactly what it is. I think it would be useful if, if, if you guys, uh, as, as bodies, put out those definitions so folk knew the parameters that they were working in um, and, and don't make claims that, uh, that are not the case. That's, a, that's a, useful, a useful reference and something we can take forward. Also, I think the other point you made is very helpful as well, and we tried to capture that in the report I mentioned that we published in June, just this definition of what we mean by short, medium and long term, because it's different things to different people, and I think it's, it would be helpful if somebody like Audit Scotland and uh, through the Commission and the Auditor General make some statements about what that might look like. So thank you. Thank you very much. Can I thank you for your evidence today, gentlemen? Um, the next committee meeting is next week on Wednesday, the 20th of August, and we'll be starting at 9.30. Uh, I now close this meeting. Thank you.